Professor uh, Thomas uh, Patrick Thomas Hoy from. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, from Department of English. Okay. Uh, College of Liberal Art here at Thomasat University. Okay. Uh, oh, is this one okay? Not too many slides, actually. I, I was originally planning to do this as a, a full speech, but um, I think I've become dependent on PowerPoint. At the end, I, I chickened out. I couldn't do it. Um, and I needed a few pictures of, um, um, to, to help me along. Um, okay, so we're talking... Um, the theme of this panel, Society in Transition, Creativities and Diversities, and that's what I've sort of tried to address here. <coughs> uh, can you just go back to the first one? Um, well, societies are always in transition. I mean, people are always in transition. If you're not, you're dead, I suppose. Even then, you're decomposing, so you're changing. So um, we're always in transition, uh, and, but I'm, I'm thinking in the context of Thailand and also of Tamasat at this 80th uh, anniversary. And I think uh, transition is perhaps not the right word. Society in repetition might be closer to it. And I think particularly of Tamasat, when we... Uh, Think of Tamasat's founder, Pretty Banomyong, died in exile. We think of another uh, important rector of Tamasat, Pure Umpakorn. The other library is named after him, the one at Rangsit, died in exile. Now it worries me to think that on the 100th anniversary of Tamasat, somebody else may mention other important, or perhaps even insignificant by then, figures from Tamasat, who also died in exile. Um, so I think we really should talk about these things. Um, so society in transition or society in repetition? Creativities and diverse, diversities or conformity and uniformity. This is what I'm going to talk about. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, tolerance and diversity in my first theme. Order, harmony and unity, my second theme. Creativity, knowledge and censorship will be my third theme. And then I'm just going to give a few <coughs> examples of what I find, you know, where I find some creative thinking at the moment. Uh, next slide, please. Let a thousand flowers bloom. You may know this quote. It's from Chairman Mao. I think the next part was, let a, let a hundred thousand flowers bloom, let a hundred schools of thought contend. Unfortunately, everyone took him seriously. And uh, as soon as they popped their heads up, looming away, he chopped them all off. So it's a little bit ironic, this, uh, this uh, title here. Okay, I'm just going to read uh, my initial abstract, which was written some time ago. As, as we know, that the... the um, there was a transition <laughs> which delayed my pre the presentation. Um, okay, and this is a rather personal reflection. The whole the whole speech, you know. So no no um, no claim to academic knowledge or anything of that sort here. A personal reflection on what I think is going on in time. Okay, I came to Thailand in 2001, and about a year later, the World Cup was on. And I wrote about this in a paper around the same time. There was a 
a series of ads sp sponsored by the Kung Tai Bank. And I thought they were very, very interesting for me. I'd only been around about six months or a year. And they struck me as very exclusive and um, perhaps even racist. And what we saw in these ads were various falang. And the, the farang was seen teaching a succession of awkward and graceless ties how to speak Thai, how to perform a Thai dance, how to make a Y, how to cook Tom Yang Gung, and finally how to give one of the famous Thai smiles. So we had uh, the Farangs as the possessors of Thainess and the Thais as awkward, graceless, you know, the, the image of everything that Thais are not supposed to be. And um, the punchline, as translated to me, was something like, aren't you ashamed that you have to be taught to be Thai? Well, that stuck with me for a long time. And, and then, as now, the ads struck me <clears throat> as an indicator of a cultural fear that Thainess and the national unity that embodies were fragile. And there was a perception of a need to defend them from the ravages of internationalization and modernity. And I think this is uh, still the case. Just uh, last week, a child psychologist of some sort came out and said that uh, nannies should be Thai. Um, well, there was a bit of a reaction to it, but I believe that the Ministry of Labor, whoever is responsible, has said, yes, they should. Because a Burmese nanny or a Lao nanny or a, a Cambodian nanny or, heaven forbid, an Australian nanny. I am, after all, the father of a Thai child. I wonder if I'm teaching him the wrong way to be Thai. We're not good enough. Would not teach pure Thainess. Um, so I think there's a still this sense, this same sense, are we Thai enough? Um, for those who uphold Thainess, today's political cult and cultural situ situation shows that the fear has sort of been justified. The three pillars are under threat in various ways. A banner on a bridge in northern Thailand during the, uh, I think in May or February during the protests, um, sparked a hysterical reaction, I thought, about the nation being ripped apart by Lana separatists. The spike in Les Majeste cases since the coup of 2006 means that even the most fervent supporters of the monarchy cannot claim that it is universally revealed, revered or they wouldn't be charging people. And the Buddhist discourse that says that the nation should be led by people who possess karmic goodness is also being challenged. What should be done? Well, people could be taught to be Thai through more edicts on proper behaviour from the Ministry of Culture, through glorious versions of Thai history and unity continue, continuing to be promoted in the classroom, more billboards, cinema ads, and TV features demonstrating the monarchy's wisdom and virtue can be made. Paying attention to the national anthem at 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. could be more strictly enforced. More thorough censorship and punishment for untie attitudes, behavior, and speech could be instituted. And Dr. Rien Tong Nana's rubbish collection organization could be licensed to take out the trash. Or is there another way? 
At the recent Thai Studies Conference uh, in April and May, April was it? Yeah. Um, held in Sydney, Professor Andrew Walker suggested that for a long time now, Thailand's political discourses and practices have been all about managing unity. This has been done with some success. The political, social and economic conditions have changed such that what now needs to be put in a place is a system which manages diversity and conflict. Such a system would have to recognise a much, much broader idea of Thainess than that which currently exists. Okay, that is obviously all completely redundant, what I've just said. I wrote that in May for a conference for this seminar which was scheduled to be held in June. Well, that didn't happen. It seems to be redundant what I'm talking about there, diversity for the next few years at least. The talking points now, the orders, are unity, not diversity. Harmony, not disagreement and disaccord and debate. Happiness, not sorrow. Happiness, not thought. The Junta has, sorry, the MCPO, has issued its 12 core values of Thainess without any debate, as far as I could see, among Thais. The Education Department has picked up on it very enthusiastically. Everyone seems to be rushing to, to get on the bandwagon and is promoting patriotic songs and marches and records of good deeds. I think this was failed, but the idea was that students would have to go to their teacher and get a good deed signed. So you, and this will somehow get you into university at some point. Um, interesting thought. Um, to report it to the teacher and filed away as part of the university entrance requirement. Oh, sorry, I meant to say, could we go to the next, um, next slide, please? Now back a bit, is that? That one, yeah. Um, thousand flowers blooming, playtime, happiness time. Um, where was I? Sorry. Uh, okay, so we file away these ideas of good deeds as part of interest requirements. The happiness fair at Sanam Luang had yet more scre free screenings of King Naras 1 5. The Ministry of Culture, or Mini Cult as I call it, has banned a computer game that threatens to destabilise the country, El Tropico. That lets people role play as a coup leader or a resistance, a resistance leader. Now, I don't know why everybody else should have all the fun. The Orwellian language of attitude readjustment and invitation to meditation is freely used while I debate with myself whether I should risk showing 1984 in my politics classes, which is something I have done for years. So, diversity we're talking about, the National Legislative Assembly, a diverse organisation comprising about 200 people, 10 of whom are diversely women, 100 of whom are diversely soldiers, not even a corporal or a sergeant or a private, but I think generals, admirals, etc. One Thainess for all ties, absolute unity and agreement. Polls showing 80 and 90 percent support for the National Council for Peace and Order. But most tellingly, a, a Junta spokesman said that people should forget 
anything that happened before the 22nd of May this year. ISOC spokesman Barnhot Pompeian, I'm not, my tie is still very bad after many years here, said, I quote, it's time for ties to stop dwelling on the past. Addressing primarily red shirt voters in the north and northeast, he said, quote, they should forget everything that happened before the 22nd of May. We are a department of liberal arts. Memory is the business of the humanities. <clears throat> and in the context of memory, as all this has been going, I've been returning to um, a writer that um, I studied in my PhD thesis and who I've tried to keep in touch with since, the great Czech dissident writer Milan Kundra. Kundra was exiled from Czechoslovakia uh, in the Stalinist period. He wrote a book called The Joke where somebody told a joke and it led on to all sorts of disasters for the joke teller. Um, but he was exiled for, for, for his, um, his dissidence, his writings, his jokes. And um, what he uh, said in his book of last, Laughter and Forgetting is this. The struggle of man against power <clears throat> is the struggle of memory against forgetting. In Thailand, lately, forgetting is mandatory, memory is banned. On the theme of harmony and happiness promoted by the totalitarian state, Kundera wrote this. He wanted the right to be unhappy. He was unhappy. He was initially a communist, a very idealistic young communist. We're going to change the world sort of thing. And he realized it didn't quite work like that. And he has an image of falling out of the circle. Everyone's holding hands, everyone's laughing, everyone's happy. He felt himself falling out. And he said about about this idea. He was excluded from the, the happy land, let's say. All human beings have always aspired to an idol, a paradise, a, a garden of Eden. Happiness. <laughs> to that garden where nightingales sing, to that realm of harmony where the world does not raise up as a stranger against man and man against other men but rather where the world and all men are shaped from one and the same matter. Innocence, happiness, no diversity. Everyone is happy because everyone is the same. Everyone is a reflection of yourself. That was what he was talking about. That was how Kundera imagined the totalitarian state as a Garden of Eden. And he thought it was a beautiful thing. He compared it to music, harmony. A great lover of Bach, he thought of it as a Bach fugue. There, everyone is a note in a sublime Bach fugue. And anyone who refuses to be one is a mere useless and meaningless black dot that needs only to be caught and crushed between thumb and finger like a flea. If the future of Thailand is the military utopian vision, utopian, um, and I was just uh, watching something on the original utopia, James, um, Thomas More's utopia. Everything was great in this utopia. There was only one rule. You had to believe in God. If you didn't, you might do the wrong things. Otherwise, everything was fine. 
execution was the punishment for those who didn't believe it. Um, as I said, if this is the future, there is no space for... Well, I'm wrong to say no space. Of course, people will always create spaces. Let, let us say there is less space for diversity and difference. And there will inevitably be dissident black dots that need to be crushed. So um, what I'm arguing is that as a faculty, as a university, the cultivation of memory is the key to understanding and rejecting or contesting power. And as humanists we have the duty to foster memory, not forgetting and to preserve, maintain, extend free discussion and speech rather than just submitting to public relations. I'm going to what you said earlier on. Um, next slide, please. So I'm just going to say a few things here about how this has uh, affected me. <clears throat> Censorship in any form is the enemy of cre creativity since it cuts off the life of creativity ideas. And uh, I want to talk about just a couple of examples of censorship and how they affect my life as a scholar. Next, please. Does anyone know this uh, man? He died a couple of years ago. He was widely recognised as a brilliant polemicist, a wit, um, a, a very a great writer, a great talker, a great debater. Not everyone agreed with him. I certainly don't. I didn't agree with his stance on Iraq. He thinks the Americans shouldn't go in. Uh, he, but he took on all comers. Atheism, uh, Iraq, um, the British uh, royal family. And he wrote and spoke brilliantly. Even his most fervent, what's the word, detractors would agree with that. Okay, I came across a reference as I was doodling around on Google to his book called The Monarchy, which is about the British royal family. And it's a diatribe against Diana and Charles and all the rest of them. The sort of thing we can usually read. Um, and I saw that this was, the, the reference was to it being located on, I don't know if you know this website, it's a sort of file sharing site called Scripty, S-C-R-W-W-W-dot-S-C-R-by-B-D-dot-com. And it's a pretty handy place. You can go there and pick up all sorts of stuff. So I thought, all oh, right, okay, good. I, I haven't read that book. And what I wanted to read it for, as much for his ideas, was his wit and style. Okay, I went to Scripty, having looked at that book, and this is what I got. I thought, my God. Christopher Hitchens is a threat. Chris, I can't read Christopher Hitchens. Well, of course I can. I mean, it's ridiculous. I can, I can, <laughs> I can go to many other places and get his work. But I thought this is absurd. This is completely absurd. I mean, I've got some some public servant somewhere has got it into his head that. Whenever I see the name Christopher Hitchens somewhere, he's bad for some reason, and I must do that to it. I can't think. It, I can't think that uh, this is a search and destroy campaign. But I was sufficiently paranoid to think, what about Thomas Paine? Who's this guy? Well, he's even deader than Christopher Hitchin. Christopher Hitchin died three years ago. He died 200 years ago. 
Thomas Paine happens to be one of Christopher Hitchens' great heroes. He's, he's written a, a short book about him. Um, but, and I thought, you know, they, they, they share a lot of, of thoughts in common. Thomas Paine also, I, I googled, had an article on Scribd called The Age of Reason. Now, let's just put Thomas Paine in context. If you are a historian who wants to study the American War of Independence or the French War of Revo uh, French Revolution, you have to read this guy. He was a brilliant pamphleteer when uh, George Washington's armies were deserting and starving and um, in the ice or snow in the Delaware somewhere. He wrote a pamphlet called Common Sense written in ordinary language that picked them all up and sent them charging off and they won the war eventually. He went to France where first of all he was elected as a member of the um, what do they call it? The, the, the national uh, parliament, the revolutionary parliament and next of all he was chucked in prison and about to be guillotined by Robespierre but where he wrote another major work, The Age of Reason about his atheist or no I shouldn't say atheist, deist ideas um, so there he was, and uh, Robespierre got beheaded before him, so he was able to get out of prison. Um, okay, so this is a major, major historical figure. Dead 200 years old. I wanted to read his pamphlet called The Age of Reason, which was available on Scripty. Can you click, please? And that's what I got. Now, that was a couple of months ago. Uh, I've looked back at Scripty to see if I can still get them. I can, I don't have this stuff now. But you have to pay at Scripty now. They've, they've finally worked out they can make some money out of it. So, I can get them if I pay, but I can't get them for free. That's what I was trying to do. So you will be able to go to, to Scripty and find these, but you can go to anywhere. All of uh, Thomas Paine's work is on Gutenberg. You know, it's important stuff. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, I, I, I mentioned before that for uh, for several years I've taught a, uh, a a social science course and uh, uh, to a very big class, 150 students. Very difficult. Um, and in the social side, I do a politics unit a module where basically we look at two forms, two films. One is Frank Capra's Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, which is a nice optimistic view of our democratic potential, the ability to transcend corruption. The, the ordinary man can have power. And for the opposite view, uh, I look at the book, uh, the film, 1984. I don't expect them to read the book. None of them will. They might now, but. <laughs> well, what, now, I'm just thinking, what happens if I do this course next year? I don't have an intimate association with these students. There's 150 of them. What are they thinking? Well, I think they'll be thinking that I have some sort of political axe to grind, that I'm trying to propagandise them. And I think that one of the things that really is a bit scary and disappointing in Thailand is that a culture of snitching is developing. I think you get 500 baht if you put someone in. Well, I can imagine that of 150 students, some of them might think that I am on the wrong political side. And they might snitch on me to, I don't know who, to 
of the government, to Professor Somkit, uh, whoever. So we are talking here, the theme of the conference is creativities and diversities. Well, my creativity has just been de-diversified a little bit, you know. I have, or maybe it's been inspired. I have to think of another book. Um, and the next one, please. Okay. The, the, the sort of brief mentions of this in the news, El Tropico 5, I've never heard of it before. Have anyone? You haven't played it? You might never. <laughs> well, the, the rhetoric around this, uh, well, by the officials who, who had banned it was, it might cause problems. It could provoke conflict. It may bring uh, diversity. Um, not sorry, not diversity. It may bring problems. May, could, might. Not is. Not does. It's a potential. Now, that person there may cause problems one day. He does. <laughs> he might. You might. May. You could. It could happen. You could go crazy and go on a psychopathic rampage. I don't think we're going to yet ban you from your existence or lock you up because you could cause problems. You might create inequality. Diversity can't, creativity can't really work with that level of fearfulness. Strange power and fear going together very thoroughly. Okay, the next slide, please. Uh, I just wanted to quote a uh, great columnist, Colin Ritty, in the Bangkok Post. The only, the only world they're fighting isn't against Tropico 5 or Hormones, another uh, show that was, you know, talked about, or a sensitive talk show, show. What they're fighting against is youth, technology, and a concept of the future. And a loser of future, but a future towards which the whole world is moving. The past isn't perfect. And it's sad that there are still a lot of good people who don't realise that the world moves only in one direction forward. Now, this is not something, you know, these problems with El Tropico and hormones and all the rest of it are not something that arose because of the NCPO. I mean, I could list a million of these over the last 13 years. I've been in Thailand. This move to, oh, we're scared of this, it might do something bad. Let's get rid of it. Um, antithetical to creativity and diversity. Okay, next, uh, next please. Um, okay, now I'm just going to have a look at a few things that I've been interested in lately, which are critical and celebratory of Thai society at the same time. And I'm, I'm doing a little bit of literary work. Um, on some novels from, from the realm of uh, Thai expat detective fiction. And I'm looking also at the, the art of this guy, Chris Coles. I just want to finish off with something that I think is good, interesting, creative, okay. And something that, you know, this is not a pretty picture of Bangkok. It might cause problems to Thailand's image. Let's go to the next one. Well, that is a pretty picture of Bangkok, the sexy bar. But it also might cause problems to Thailand's image. A soy dog. And the next one, uh, this is a book about, really about the politics of the last 10 years and about Thainess. <clears throat> how Thainess is manipulated, how it becomes a cover for things, uh, how uh, people are brainwashed um, and it's all about the, the last 10-12 years of politics 
it hits on all sides. It goes against everyone. Um, and the cover is, is another of those paintings. Okay, so I think there's, there's a, you know, obviously I said before, um, critical, creative, diverse expression can still flourish. It's more difficult, you know, when there's an atmosphere of fear. Um, but I think uh, universities have the responsibility to remember, not to forget, and I think far too often at this university and others, forgetfulness is the hallmark. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll just finish off. Thanks for listening. Thanks for agreeing. Thanks for disagreeing. It's all okay, I hope. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Thomas Patrick Hoy. And never before that I feel so close to prison than uh, listen to your I mean, talk today. Thank you so much. <laughs>